just really excited to be here again. Um, and, and again, thank you everybody for coming uh, today. Great list of speakers. Um, and I'll bring on our keynote in just a minute. Uh, we've got Cisco at last in Trulio, the athletic talk about some really interesting topics about kind of customer life cycle. Um, but we've got this really great talk coming up from Steven DeMarco um, from Kantar talking about uh, the million dollar question, essentially how brands should be using AI and machine learning. And I'd love to bring Steven up. Steven, you can finally come up. I'll, I'll let you in. And then um, I'll, I'll be back up here for Q and A at the end. Steven, let's, let's bring you up. Oh, and we got Carrie as well. Um, so <laughs> I will disappear. Thank you, Scott. Apologies for um, rushing the stage a little early. Um, I was doing my best to, to follow the orders and click the links, and I think I was a little premature. So appreciate that you were able to roll with that. Um, hello, everyone. Carrie and I are really excited to kick off today's sessions with a view from the wild and woolly world of advertising. Um, there's a certain danger in being a keynote speaker on day two in an event uh, because your greatest fear is that all of the good content is covered on day one. Um, so what we're hoping is that we're gonna shed some new light on some ideas, provoke some conversations that can sustain through the day. And recalling our presentation, the million dollar questions, which is a reference to some very, and you know, still existential challenges that marketers are facing today. It's the kind of questions that can only be solved through new approaches, especially, especially analytic driven approaches. Uh, and that's what we wanna kick around today between Carrie and I. Um, Carrie and I are gonna be a partner in crime. Um, we'll take you through how data and analytics are coming to the foreground as ways for marketers to tackle the biggest professional challenges that they've ever faced. Um, they are million dollar questions. They might be billion dollar questions for some companies, um, but we figured, uh, you know, if we had the honor of keto for everybody, we better address the million dollar questions versus the $5 questions that um, sometimes fill up our calendars. So with all that said, we're going to take a different approach to today. We're going to, rather than flipping through dozens of PowerPoint slides, we're going to have an interactive conversation between Carrie and I. That way, if I forget to make an important point, Carrie's going to swoop in, she's promised to swoop in and save the day like she does most of the days for me. So thanks, Carrie. Uh, but before we jump in, we thought we'd build on Scott's introduction and share a fun, slightly, slightly embarrassing fact about each other just to, to lighten the mood. Did you know that Carrie's first job was actually not on the account side of an advertising agency, but on the creative side as an intern? And her first task for the week was to draw, redraw the same fish <laughs> time and time again. Unfortunately, she never managed to draw that fish correctly uh, and quickly abandoned her career on the creative side and came <laughs> up. We're, we're all the better for it. <laughs> Thanks, Steven. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Um, so, fun fact about Steven. Hmm. Did you know? He has a raging case of poison ivy right now and is hiding it <laughs> with all of his might. <laughs> uh, we've, we've decided that Stephen, given all of his responsibilities at Kantar, running the creative domain and running the media domain and in product innovation and all of our different superpower oversight, and that he really probably should be working from a bubble. At it. So we're, calling, we're going to call him the bubble boy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I can start. Um, so, you know, let me start by making an obvious point. The world is just a hot mess right now. From COVID to racial injustice to a recession and a looming presidential election, and then there's a little terra firma for consumers and the marketers who are courting them to stand on, which makes an incredible interesting time in the field of market research. CMTR has the data and analytic expertise to track these disruptions, and we counsel marketers on how to respond. While our business, like mo most of you and most folks here today, is down in terms of sales, our team is busier than ever using our superpowers. We call them our superpowers because we've been able to integrate new areas of practice, analytics, neuro neuroscience, and qualitative techniques to explain the present and divine the future for our clients. On the COVID front, as of last week, 
70% of consumers are worried about the pandemic and half say they are delaying their return to normal consumer habits due to health and safety concerns. Most Americans think federal and state governments have not responded correctly, especially compared to how governments have responded in other countries. And pent up anxieties have not only manifested in social protests, but unfortunately also to the tra tragic deaths of innocent black Americans. Nearly three quarters of black Americans feel that brands don't care about them or their communities compared to 40% of white Americans. Can you imagine trying to grow your business when three quarters of your customers don't trust you? As a marketer who depends on consumers and the dollars that flow from them, it's a perfect storm of disruption. And just building that, I did see that uh, our current president Trump um, moved to delay the elections. Um, so he was unable to delay the pandemic, unable to prevent racial injustice, and certainly unable to delay the recession. So I think the last he was on to his last straw there, which is maybe maybe he can delay the the elections. But I'm not making a political statement. I will say I was on a phone call uh, with a classmate a few weeks back. And um, she mused the following, you know, we're experiencing centuries of racial injustice, the biggest recession in over 50 years, the worst pandemic we've faced in a decade, a generation defining presidential election. And just last, last month, NASA confirmed the existence of UFOs. This is by all means a nutball's time to be a marketer. Uh, and kudos to all of us for having the fortitude and resilience to, to soldier on. Um, at Kantar, we're helping our clients who are feeling paralyzed to do three things in a sequence. First, react so you can survive. Second, restore, was to, which is to anticipate the next normal. And three is to reset, which is to transform your, our business and their business um, to the new reality. And that's gonna happen all over the next several months. So it's a really exciting time. Great data, great analytics, great consulting, um, regardless if they're from Cantor or, or, or from anybody here on this call, can create a foundation for new, bold, customer-centric growth. We need to get off the sidelines and we need to get back into the game. So we're going to be talking about the million-dollar questions, which is how we get back into the game. Next slide, please. So the first very basic question is, should I be advertising right now? And after years uh, a pumping out advertising campaign after advertising campaign, marketers are literally paralyzed. I, I use the analogy of me showing up at the eighth grade dance. Um, I had enough courage to have my mom drive me to the eighth grade, eighth grade dance, but I didn't know what to say to anybody to dance. I always came home a little, um, a little bummed out. I was too nervous. Um, so marketers are trying to figure out, do they go quiet right now? Do they support the pandemic or social injustice? Uh, do they stay the course with their existing advertising, as we've seen pharma companies do? They haven't changed a beat. Uh, and we've seen examples of each, and some have worked and some haven't. Um, we think that marketers should be advertising right now. Um, but we also recognize that consumers and, and media critics are, are quick to point out the missteps. Staying quiet really isn't an option. So, Carrie. So, can you go to the next slide, please? 5% of consumers believe brand, brands should, only 5%, 95% believe brands continue advertising. That's a lot, you know, and there's a couple of reasons behind that, that statistic. And it's basically um, consumers want to see advertising because it signals a normal world and a world that they're used to. Um, and uh, smart consumers expect marketers to voice their role in evolving culture and society which is also part of the challenge that we're facing because it, it really kind of demands real-time advertising and being tuned in to what's going on around the world around us. And, you know, clearly that means that there's gotta be a deep human understanding is going to be the fuel for recovery for all of us. Yeah, I would say as a point of reference um, where clients are asking this very basic question, like what is the role of advertising in culture and society right now is such an existential question. Um, and it reminds me of uh, a client event that we held just a little over a hundred days ago in Miami. And during the event, we had leading marketers, 200 of us flew to Miami, stayed in the same hotel 
and debated bold strategies for breaking through to consumers and, and all of the innovative approaches that we were taking. We, um, and we did it all without social distancing or wearing a mask. That was just 100 days ago. Two weeks after that event, the conversation ceased to be about breaking through to, advert to, to consumers, and it was very much about, can we even advertise right now? And when you think about this, just 5% of consumers believe brands should, top ad should stop advertising. That is a key release for marketers. That is a key release uh, function for a CMO. And as Terry said, consumers expect and want to see advertising because it reminds, me, reminds them of the normal world that they used to inhibit. Kara, I think you have a, a question, another question for me. So are advertisers going dark or are they spending? Well, I'll, tell, I'll answer it two ways. Um, what we've seen, and we proved it recession after recession, is that going dark is a really difficult decision to make. Um, when sales are restricted, uh, CFOs are likely to come after the marketing budget, which is the, one of the largest line items in the overall company's P&L. Um, but we've done a study with the ARF um, 10 years ago um, during the last recession where we, were, we were, where we were able to demonstrate the brands that stuck with advertising through the recession not only rebounded quicker, um, but were also able to gain share points uh, and were able to sustain those share points um, versus other companies. The companies that went onto the, who went dark and went onto the sidelines had to spend more money to get back into third or fourth place. So there's, there are major uh, perils um, that a company would experience going dark um, that will resonate with a CMO and a CFO, right? Very key to make that economic argument. So if you go to the next slide, what we've seen is, um, I'll show you, this is a snapshot of media spending data in North America. So this is the total amount of media dollars that advertisers are purchasing from January, 2019 to January, 2020. And you'll see on the left-hand side that um, 2019 levels are above 2020 levels. Uh, but then you also see a little bit of seasonality over the summer, uh, advertising starts to trend down. What we're seeing though in 2020 is after an absolutely abysmal March and April, we start to see glimmers of hope in May. And so if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see that the, um, the V starts to even out so that the, we stop dipping in May and it's an ever small improvement, but it was great to stem the bleeding. And then we see an, an uptick in June. Now we're still down in June, but we're down less. Um, and before you can get back to whole, you need to re re repair all of the loss that you incurred. And so what we've done is, is forecasted out. Now this is assuming no major setbacks with a second wave of, of COVID. We forecast July and August, and we have a pretty good read on July since we're nearly through the month. Um, that July will continue to rebound and with sports coming online and with the back to school season coming online, um, that August will be strong as well. So it's highly unlikely, damn near impossible, that we'll recover all the way and grow in 2020 in terms of media dollars, um, which is a great leading indicator for many, many things. But I do think that we have stemmed the shrinkage and we, all, we will slowly climb our way out of this one. My estimate is by Q1. I think Forrester is estimating Q2, and I think a lot of that really depends on um, how things unfold over the next couple of months. So advertisers are not going dark. Um, certain sectors, they are more than others, but they're not. Um, and there's a good reason. It's a target-rich environment for advertising. Homebound consumers are spending more time on media platforms than ever, um, and the media platforms that they're spending time on are incredibly brand-friendly. Online video, OTT, addressable TV, you know, they're all rich branding platforms and they're also highly targetable platforms. Mm -hmm. What we see is advertisers who are shifting their dollars into these newer platforms um, where they can create more immersive ads are actually seeing greater impact with their campaigns than they have in the past. So it just does bear out that story that when you advertise through recession in the correct way, you will see a positive impact, not only on your brand metrics, but also your sales metrics. And the brands that are courageous enough to do that are gonna create distance between themselves and their less bold rivals. Clearly a plug for everyone on this call is, in order to have the fortitude to make those investments, you need really good data and analytics to back it up. 
Uh, and I know that um, Carrie and I are gonna talk a little bit about that right now, um, but I know that a lot of people here uh, in this conference also have great analytics to help marketers defend these important decisions. So let's hit the next slide. So we all agree marketers should be advertising right now. Maybe they wanna reallocate their investments. Maybe they need to cut them a little bit to align with demand and supply, but be afraid of the dark is the message. If you go dark, it's a very tough road to hoe to get back. Um, so with the commitment to advertise, then we have to say, okay, how do I determine the right thing to say? How do I avoid being the shy eighth grader who gets to the dance, but is too cautious to engage someone in a conversation, much less a dance. So I'm gonna ask Carrie some questions. Um, what we know is two thirds of campaign impact is borne out by the creative and the remaining one third is borne out um, by the media placement. So how can we use analytics of all things, you know, science, data, technology, how can we use analytics to help identify the right thing to say to the consumers we're courting? Well, there's, there's a number of different ways that we can do it. Um, we can use data in surveys, we can use data in uh, analytics, but we can also turn to AI and some of the new solutions that we have going on. We have uh, AI that can recognize imagery through social media channels and identify trends and patterns to draw insights from, and we have AI that can um, batch test creative um, and, and basically uh, produce the same measures that you do when you get a survey. So we're going to talk a little bit more about all these things and we'll use the COVID advertising as an example of how we went about um, using uh, data and AI to come up with some insights that led to uh, thought leadership for our clients. So the first thing we noticed was that um, at the beginning of the impact we have a barometer report and it's a survey that um, basically asks people how they're feeling right now. And you can see at the very beginning, um, back in March when the outbreak was first breaking, that people were concerned about health. And they didn't really, it was all still a shock. And this, this dangerous disease is out there. What do we do about it? And uh, taking care of my health was really kind of a, a top priority. And as the uh, weeks kind of passed, and even in a short period of time over the course of the month, by mid-April, their concern for health was going down and the concern for financial security was going up. So that's kind of like, okay, macro insight number one. So then if you click the slide, the next thing we turned to was identifying um, through AI and, uh, and oops, I'm sorry, um, identifying through uh, neuroscience. What are people really feeling right now? What are they, what are they, what is the intuitive associations? And when we talk about intuitive associations is when it's that system one thinking when what, uh, what pops into your brain when we ask you this question. And so when we asked people how they were feeling, um, you know, over the course of weeks, their feelings were bouncing around. But the one thing that was common was this very um, high level of uncertainty. No surprise there, right? But really high levels of uncertainty and along in the beginning, along came with that uncertainty was actually positive um, emotions like, OK, well, we're in this together and we're hopeful. But as the weeks kind of passed down, we started to see an erosion in those positive emotions and um, and the, uh, the level of uncertainty came down a little bit, but so did the positive emotions as things started to really sink in. So that was kind of another point that we took as we started to think about how to go forward. And if you click to the next slide. Um, so then we took a look at, well, let's take a look at what are the other advertisers saying? Well, like, okay, let's these brave brands that went out there right away with COVID ads. How are they doing it? What were they saying? What was working and what was not working? So we took 50, um, 50 videos from different brands across 25 categories and we batch tested them through Link AI. When I talk about batch testing, it's basically Link AI is this new AI um, solution that we have that can measure brand engagement and brand predisposition through scores like persuasion and branding, appealing, uh, short-term sales likelihood, and so on, and basically um, do that in a really fast um, period of time. So we can upload one ad per per uh, every 15 minutes and get results. So it's, it's a dashboard web app, and you can just upload ads, and then within 15 minutes you get the results. And it makes it really easy to take a look at campaign 
wide or uh, category wide advertising. So um, when we looked at all the COVID ads, um, we noticed a few things that came out. So on top of the insights that we had drawn from the survey and the neuroscience, um, we also drew four key insights that I'll take you through. If you can click, thanks. So the first one is going back to that high level of uncertainty and um, low, uh, growing levels of uh, negative uh, feelings. Optimism, optimism is really important. So this isn't just for for a crisis like COVID, it's basically any type of crisis. And when consumers um, turn the TV on or they're online and they're watching videos, they don't want to see a bunch of like really heavy messages from brands. They want to see optimism um, and authentic optimism. So the brands that were really doing this well um, in the very beginning were Taco Bell. They offered a deal and they talked about sharing, how you can share at home and share a meal at home, even if it was virtual and being with friends. So it's kind of, a, okay, we'll make the best of the situation. Nike celebrated people at home and invited them to play together. If you remember that TV spot where a lot of um, athletes were actually um, practicing in their small spaces inside. And then Hershey and, Hershey and Samsung talked about coming together with, the, with those who are closest to us. So that's like a good thing that comes out of all this. We're actually spending more time together than we would um, normally. Although I just had a conversation with my 19 year old daughter last night and I don't think she's too, she's really kind of done with it all, but we'll get to that later. Um, so the creative guardrail here is optimism that works, that be, is, is that, that optimism that best acknowledges how we're living through this together and really kind of rooting into the day to day kind of challenges that we're facing. Next insight is being constant in an uncertain world. So this is all about familiarity, right? Um, so when you think about every, if, if the whole world is being disruptive and a brand has got um, an iconic product or has been around for a long time or has a, has a nice nostalgia to it, then it would be great to dial those up at this period of time or in times of crisis. So those brands that are doing it well, Kraft, they had a COVID ad that showed um, basically farm to table, how they make macaroni and cheese and Heinz ketchup and how they bring it to the kitchen table every night. So two icon, not new, not new products, nothing new there, but iconic products that are like basically in everyone's pantry. The second thing would be um, Oreos um, showed people playing uh, games at home, lots of board games, and they tapped into kind of what was going on at the time when we were all under quarantine in the very beginning. And, and you know, also showed how people were using Oreos as game markers to kind of like play a game. And that was kind of a good way that like Oreos brand positioned around being playful and they kind of used that to their advantage. Um, the creative guardrail here is, is don't pretend to have the history and love if you don't. So don't fake it. Again, it goes back to that brand really truly being true to their DNA and being authentic. The third insight is um, action over words. So uh, the ads that had CEOs talking to the audience, they were maybe they resonated, um, but they didn't do as well as the ads that actually showed employees saying, here's what we're all up against. So especially when the companies came out and the brands came out and talked a lot about keeping customers safe, keeping their employees safe. Frida Lay came out and said, this isn't really about us and our bottom line. This is about our employees and our communities and their messaging focused around what they're doing for their employees and their communities and putting action before words. The United States Post Office was good timing under a lot of pressure right now as it continues to be with funding, but basically had postal workers go out there and say, we're out there every day. Look, the world is upside down right now, but the, your mail is still getting delivered because we're committed and, and we're dedicated and this is our job and we're going to do our job. So that was coming from the employees and that resonated a lot more than something coming from um, top management. And then final insight is, okay, we're all suffering a little bit from COVID ad fatigue by the time May rolled around. So we took a look at who was trying to break out from this. And breaking out and being different is has always been and will continue to be an important factor in advertising success. So we actually have to give a little bit of credit to Budweiser for coming, like repackaging their WhatsApp ads um, that they had in Super Bowls a few years back, many years back when they still had wall phones and, and giant um, mobile phones. But they, uh, 
they actually redubbed it to, to kind of like match up with what was going on with the COVID dialogue today. And then YouTube, you know, sticking to what they really do well, which is you can find any type of do-it-yourself video on YouTube and showing a montage of do-it-yourself videos of people kind of laughing at themselves, trying to do things that they normally wouldn't be doing themselves, like haircuts and things like that. So it's imperative to stay different, and that's going to continue to be a challenge for advertisers going forward as we continue to roll through the disruption um, and, and, and face new challenges throughout the year and next year. I want to I want to dwell on the slide a little bit. I would like to dwell on the prior slide for a little bit um, because I think it's incredibly interesting application of artificial intelligence in a real world scenario. So I almost want to like unpack this and talk through the dynamics here, even getting into the nitty gritty of like the agency workflow, right? Mm -hmm. um, just to unpack it a little bit, I think what, what we've done is over the past two decades, we have tested how many ads? 200,000 ads? Mm -hmm. uh, 200,000. 200,000 ads using a uh, testing methodology that is that validates consumer survey responses to accurately predict in-market performance of an ad. So, you know, a client will come to us and, and other companies in the space and say, I would like you to evaluate this ad. And it would take a couple of weeks, a couple hundred consumers, tens of thousands of dollars. And we would come out and say, we think this ad is, you know, fits in the right quartile or we think this ad doesn't fit in the right quartile and you need to make these adjustments. So we've done that uh, across 20 years, 200,000 ads, 40 million consumer interactions. So it is a ripe data set for AI. And we trained our algorithms on that data set. So what we can now do is for any other new ad that comes in, we can run that ad through the machine learning tool in 15 minutes for a fraction of the cost. And what comes out of that is some extremely counterintuitive findings, especially during a pandemic um, where clients aren't sure if they can advertise at all or if they can use humor in an ad. And, you know, they are absolutely, like we talked about, paralyzed. So counterintuitive findings that then get interpreted by a human being who's an expert in creative ideation, understanding plat you know, idea platforms, understanding how to turn it into consumer-friendly messaging that will motivate a positive brand, brand uh, disposition or purchase intent. What an incredible application <laughs> of, of artificial intelligence, an incredibly practical application of artificial intelligence when the, when the industry needs it the most. Very cool. Um, yeah. So, so any, yeah, uh, I, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, um, no, I was just going to say, you know, that's right. And, and, and that's opening up whole new use cases for using that because we can access that data so quickly because we can do it in batch. It's just, just opening up all kinds of new use cases on how to evaluate ways to go forward and how to strategize around messaging. Um, As a marketer, you can do this with your own campaigns. You can do this with competitive campaigns, you can do it with out of industry campaigns. It's very fast, it's very affordable to get an insight. My favorite anecdote is when a client refused to believe that they could use humor in advertising during the pandemic, in the early days of the pandemic. And we were able to demonstrate that a Reese's ad for their take five candy bar um, which was ran during the Super Bowl and we tested during the Super Bowl and tested very well during the Super Bowl. Um, we tested it again in May and the ad performed better in May than it did during the Super Bowl, which just uh, reinforces the fact that consumers want to, for consumers, uh, humor is like the best remedy for anxiety, right? It is nature's remedy for anxiety. You can exercise, you can drink, you can do both, drink on your Peloton, as I call it, or you can use humor and that diffuses anxiety. And having that evidence-based argument was a great unlock for many advertisers, as Carrie talked about. Yeah. 
All right, so we've answered the first two questions. Should I, how sh should I advertise? And how do I know what to advertise and what to say? But the next challenge is how do we talk to the CFO and convince him that it's all going to work? Nothing makes me happier as a marketer to engage a CFO in a economic conversation about the value of advertising um, because it's a teaching opportunity. Uh, it's a really fantastic teaching opportunity. So if you go to the next slide, what we see is about only half of advertisers are confident that they've got the right balance between brand building and what's called short-term performance marketing, otherwise known as achieving your near-term sales targets. And this short-termism is prevalent. It's, it's due to the quarterly reporting requirements of the financial markets. It's due to the influence of large investors um, demanding returns um, from their investments. And unfortunately, it has very little to do with how to engage consumers in a productive relationship. Um, and I say unfortunately, because at the end of the day, our businesses succeed or fail based on consumers. Uh, and we need to honor that. Um, so we need to make sure that our advertising that we're putting out there is in fact having an impact with consumers, both in the short term and the long term. I think advertising measurement and then by extension, advertising optimization, which is even more exciting, is one of the most exciting innovative areas in marketing right now. Uh, there is a ton of venture activity. There is a ton of innovation coming from larger companies. Um, marketers are clamoring for it. So it's really fertile ground. Um, but CFOs are, are, are right to worry about getting return on their media expenditures, especially in a recession. Um, so there's a, a bit of a, of a balance and counterbalance that needs to occur. Um, so we, we made CFOs feel okay, that is to, to advertise during recession because there's an opportunity to grow a share of voice and grow a market share. But how do we actually demonstrate that it's working? It's one thing to use a case study and it's another thing to have actual results. So we started out, uh, and this is part of my professional history, um, in the very early days of digital media and doing simple brand lift studies on campaigns where some people were shown an ad and other people were not shown an ad. And we looked at the difference in their brand, brand predisposition, brand affinity, brand attributes, and ultimately purchase intent. And what you know, we wanted to see is, first, is there a lift for people who saw the ad? Where there's a lift, that's a good story. Then we got a little smarter and we said, okay, we can actually break it down. We can actually figure out which media properties are, draw, are driving more lift and which creatives are driving more lift. So that was good. Now we're in this position where we're trying to come up with, you know, this, this perfect information where we're going beyond a uh, lift to full funnel attribution across all media channels. So that means for any placement, we want to make sure that we understand how to attribute um, the impact correctly for both sales and mid funnel and top of funnel brand outcomes. Um, so popular term for that is MTA. MTA tends to rely a little too much on sales metrics. Um, and given that supply chains and, and logistics are so compromised right now because of the recession, um, not thinking that, and, and, and also that consumers emotionally are, are all over the place, as Carrie talked about, I don't think that MTA is, is a is a sufficient solution. I could say it's necessary, but not sufficient. So we've gone beyond MTA and developed a, a capability called balanced attribution, which allows clients to understand uh, the role of brand in and out as, a, as an input metric into a sales outcome, and then an out, out, output outcome metric uh, as a, as a, a, to have a halo effect on future sales. And so what we've done is been able to give marketers the tools to optimize for both short and long-term. So basically satisfying this CFO's need to understand near-term impacts, and then the marketers need to drive a long-term Brown Foundation that will drive sales in the out months. It's a fascinating 
capability. We've, um, we've, to be honest, we're still in kind of phase one of rolling it out, um, but the results have been quite compelling, both for uh, subscription services and online, online retailing services. So I think um, the most responsible way to demonstrate um, a campaign is, is working is to both focus on the near-term brand outcomes and the longer term, uh, sorry, near-term sales outcomes and longer-term brand outcomes um, using emotions as a predictor. Okay, you can click to the next slide. All right, so we're now at the fourth million dollar question. And Carrie, you and I are raking in the big bucks. So don't go dark. Use AI to understand the right thing to say, learning from yourself and competitors. Demonstrate impact across the entire funnel through balanced attribution, satisfying the CMO and the CFO. And then set yourself up for success with additional applications of AI and machine learning. So Carrie, a you know, not too, not too long ago, people actually debated whether there was a role for AI in the creative practice of advertising. And I think that we've, we've demonstrated that there's a very strong role for, for AI and it's not just about automation, but in fact, incremental, significantly incremental insights generation. What's your perspective on the future? Yeah, I think, um, I'm sorry, can, yeah, I, th I think it, right now, so so in the past we've used AI and algorithms to really um, connect granular data to media outcomes. And what we're starting to see now with new AI solutions in, in the creative effectiveness space is that finally, like the holy grail, how does creative and media drive ROI? So it's been, we've always been able to attach media investment and strategy to ROI. And now there's an opportunity for us to really kind of connect creative effectiveness to ROI. And when you combine those two together, it will be really strong. It will be able to uncover insights and, and help us develop strategies that will be much more sh sharper and targeted towards uh, ROI strategies. So that's what's really exciting about it. And I think when it comes to tomorrow, um, as we, you know, and I can give you an example of that. You know, if you take, uh, uh, if you take a campaign and you say there's 20 ads in the campaign and you batch test all those ads for creative effectiveness through something like Link AI, and you um, then build a model on how that's going to directly correlate to, you know, by using, you could use, um, you know, the balanced attribution or you could use in, like sales data and how you're gonna directly correlate all that predictive data to the outcomes. And then you have a model that you can customize for your brand to really kind of then build sharper um, strategies. So, so that's kind of how it would work. And, um, you know, it's gonna be, we're still at the very, very beginnings of using AI. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, is it taking over people's jobs and, and it all, we're all gonna be automated and we're not gonna need creative thinking or strategic thinking anymore. That's not true. Um, more and more, and, and, and you know, we're certainly not the only company to be saying this, um, but AI is a tool that can help us um, discover insights that machines can pick up that we can't pick up because it's such granular data. And so it's an iterative journey. And the more we go out and talk about how we can start to use AI in advertising strategies, the more we see our clients um, build out new use cases. And so it's going to be as in most technology as it advances and develops further, it's going to be less, less about, oh, how the technology works and the effort that we have to put into the technology and more about, okay, it's a tool, we're going to use it and it's going to become part of the way we do our work. And uh, new patterns will emerge. Uh, we'll be able to have more time to, less time. AI is great for all the tactical stuff, um, the time consuming, tedious nature of some of the work that we all do in both creative and media. And we'll free up you know, media you know, experts and strategists and creative experts to explore more and to think more about big ideas and to actually invent new ways of advertising. So, uh, I think it's a pretty exciting time, and I think that's the way that's the, the way to look at it um, because uh, there's no there's no replacement for creativity. There's no replacement for 
highly skilled and strategic minds. And our business is filled with both of those. And AI is going to be a powerful tool for all of us. Yeah, I think the best advertising is born out of the best creative briefs. Uh, right. If you've looked at it, creative briefs recently, they're not great um, because they lack the insights. And what AI can do is find that needle in the haystack that's the kernel of the idea that can really get a creative team's juices flowing. And um, frankly, they like that. They like strong creative briefs that are based in a human truth. So let's fire through the last couple slides because I know we're getting towards the end. And I do see a question from uh, Rebecca, which I appreciate it. So we answered the million dollar questions facing marketers. They're, they're simple, um, they're big, um, but they're perilous questions. And the way that we can answer them and, and restore some normalcy to the world of marketing is turning to what's always worked for us in the past, which is great insights born out of great data. And what we now see is through the clever use of, of analytics, artificial intelligence, and even neuroscience, um, we're uncovering new insights for brands that they can capitalize on. Next slide, please. So here's the challenge that Carrie and I want to issue you for the rest of the day. How are we going to relieve marketers from their paralysis? Let's talk about that today. What are practical things that we can do to restore movement to the industry? That's number one. Number two. That would be the next slide, please. The opportunity to do that is to fill the void that your competition is leaving open. There are, are still brands who are sitting on the sidelines. Your opportunity is to get into the game and start growing, and start learning. If you don't, a rival is going to do that. They're going to take your market share. So how do you do it? Number three. Next slide, please. Deep human understanding. It is the currency for marketing going forward. Only the brands with the deepest human understanding will be the ones that grow. We've actually quantified it using our Brand Z database, and we've demonstrated that brands who act with deep human understanding innovate faster and communicate their innovations more strongly and will grow four times faster than brands that don't. So and a very important reason to do that. Uh, I, that is the end of the presentation, and I do want to answer Rebecca's question because I really appreciate when people submit questions, and it's a really important one. So Rebecca Nelson's question is, have you looked at the way brands have tried to pivot to or combine COVID themes with racial justice themes? And the short answer is yes. Um, we are doing it right now. We have a process that Carrie was stepping, stepping you through, which is called Creative Guardrails. And every month we collect new ads that have broken and uh, we're putting them through our process to understand um, how predictive they are uh, and will be of, of consumers' reaction and in-market uh, performance. So we've done that for COVID, which is how Kerry was be able to deliver that information. We're doing it now for Black Lives Matter themed advertising. The interesting and perhaps disappointing truth is that the number of COVID themed ads probably outnumbered the number of black lives or social justice themed ads by a factor of at least 10 to one. Um, and that's horrible. Um, so we're analyzing that data right now. Um, we'll likely actually have the creative guardrails to share next week. And it is a, it's a piece of thought leadership that we put out there for free to the industry um, just to help again, move the ball forward. So, sorry, no findings yet, but they'll be, they'll be in next week. A couple of other things I wanna put out. So any of the data that we shared today um, is available to you, the participants. And uh, we do a weekly tracking study and a bi-weekly tracking study on consumer behavior, both in North America, consumer attitudes and behavior in North America and globally as it relates to COVID and the repercussions of the pandemic. We can also make a lot of that data available to you for free for you to crunch 
for you to develop your own thought leadership on, um, for you to educate the market around. Um, you can just ship it to you in flat files uh, and you can have at it. So I would just contact uh, Carrie Benson or myself. Thank you all very much. Your virtual participation um, and Scott. Thank you both, uh, Carrie and Stephen. Um, now we'll be shifting over to uh, the point where we encourage you to go visit our sponsors and exhibitors. I'm going to go over to the chat lounge, um, and then um, we'll have a bunch of great speakers after that. But thank you again, Perry and Stephen, and we'll see everybody um, in the chat lounge and the exhibitors area. Thank you. Thank you.